Welcome to POTUS 2016. I'm Brian Lehrer. The massacre of 14 people in San Bernardino, California, by a young Muslim couple is still triggering aftershocks in the presidential campaigns. The murderers, inspired by ISIS, according to the FBI, brought terror home and then this. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete <laughs> shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Trump's proposal to temporarily ban Muslims except U.S. citizens from entering the U.S. could not have been in greater contrast to President Obama's calm but firm address to the nation, which included a warning to Muslims to reject violence, but this warning too. But just as it is the responsibility of Muslims around the world to root out misguided ideas that lead to radicalization, it is the responsibility of all Americans, of every faith, to reject discrimination. It is our responsibility to reject religious tests on who we admit into this country. Trump embraces the religious test, but a few of his GOP opponents, who often find themselves emulating his tough talk, have not done so. This time, Jeb Bush called Trump unhinged. Chris Christie called the plan ridiculous and unproductive. However, those with more competitive poll numbers, like Ted Cruz, stopped well short of condemnation. Cruz said, it's not my policy and shouldn't be the focus of anti-terror efforts, but also said he liked Trump and wouldn't condemn him. Marco Rubio avoided the substance of the ban, saying only the Trump's kind of outlandish talk will not bring Americans together. The Democrats were more direct. Hillary Clinton tweeted that it was a reprehensible idea. Bernie Sanders called Trump a demagogue. And Martin O'Malley tweeted, this removes all doubt. Trump is running for president as a fascist demagogue. But do those labels explain Donald Trump? Does he have an underlying philosophy? Where did he get his deep need to always be right and to win? We'll dig into that shortly with a Trump biographer. But first... Yes, the horse race. This week, we wonder, along with countless others, what effect Donald Trump's ban on Muslims plan is having on his chances of winning the nomination. Unfortunately, we will have to wait another week for reliable polling numbers, and therefore we turn once again to the betting markets, which factor all of what we know and change continuously in real time. Now, possibly due to the broad international condemnations reported in the media, Trump's odds appear to be taking a hit. At the British online wagering site Betfair, where $650,000 in wagers on the likely GOP nominee have been placed, Donald Trump's chances are now about 5 to 1. In other words, a dollar bet on him would earn you 5 if he actually wins. A bit of a long shot now. And that is now even with Ted Cruz, who had been only the third most likely favorite to win. Marco Rubio remains the strong favorite and would return only about 250 on a $1 bet. How much will Trump's comments hurt him with voters? Unknown. But here's a hint. When voters were asked in a Fox News poll last month whether there should be a religious test for Syrian refugees, 64% of Americans called the ban shameful. When only Republicans were asked, the number in opposition to such a ban dropped, but to a still significant 49%. One trend that shows no sign of reversing is the attention Donald Trump receives in the media, at least on nightly network news. According to the Tyndall Report, which tallies up the larger broadcast network news coverage of the candidates, Trump has garnered more attention than all the Democratic candidates combined. As of November 30th, Trump has taken up a whopping 234 minutes of the 857 minutes devoted to campaign reporting on CBS, NBC, and ABC, while all Democrats shown in the tall blue bar have collectively fielded a total of eight minutes less than Trump. The second most talked about candidate, Hillary Clinton, trails behind Trump with less than half of his airtime. 
And who is likely to benefit from a Trump implosion if that occurs? Well, that honor seems likely to go to Ted Cruz, who continues to shadow the Trump campaign in spirit and is running strong ground campaigns in numerous primary states. Cruz has also just this past week climbed ahead of Trump in Iowa for the first time in some polls. A win in Iowa would certainly bolster the scant seven minutes of network news coverage that he got through November. According to a recent Monmouth University live interview poll of likely Republican voters, Ted Cruz rises above Trump to claim 24 percent of the vote. Marco Rubio also gives Trump a run for his money, sitting at two points behind Trump at 17 percent. Carson continues to unravel since mid-November, as you can see. With the numbers so close, you can see how much of a headache Donald Trump is for a GOP that would like to see a clear winner they can rally behind soon. Sending more shivers up the spines of the GOP, yesterday Trump tweeted out a link to a USA Today Suffolk University poll showing that 68 percent of Trump supporters would abandon the party should he run as an independent. Meanwhile, little has changed on the Democratic side, with Hillary Clinton remaining the overwhelming favorite in most polling, but there has been a glimmer of light for Bernie Sanders. Quinnipiac University reports that Sanders handily beats all Republican frontrunners in a general election matchup and also has the highest approval rating of any candidate at all. Head-to-head, Sanders beats Trump 49 percent to 41 Against fellow Senator Marco Rubio, his lead shrinks to 44 percent versus 43 percent. But he beats Ted Cruz by a wide margin of 10 points. This is good news for the Democrats, who now have two candidates polling well against the leading Republicans. All right, as promised, time to dig deeper into the character of Donald Trump, the man who knows just what inflammatory thing to say next in order to stay in the limelight. Here's a reminder of some of that. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. You know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes, uh, blood coming out of her wherever. Look at that face, the magazine quotes Trump is saying. Would anyone vote for that? I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. Mark my words. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. I saw people getting together and in fairly large numbers celebrating as the World Trade Center was coming down. I would bomb the out of them. That's the Donald Trump we know from the campaign. Let's turn back the clock and hear how that Donald came to be. On Monday, we spoke with biographer Gwenda Blair, author of The Trumps, Three Generations of Builders and a Presidential Candidate. It's a scholarly, thick volume, a decade in the writing. Blair told us that Donald, his father and grandfather had much in common, exemplifying three phases of American entrepreneurship. It all began with Grandpa Trump, who immigrated from Germany to the U.S., and later rushed to the Yukon, not to mine for gold, but to mine the miners. He had hotels, he had saloons, he had restaurants in which people could get liquor, they could get food, of course, and they could get access to women. It was a very wild time then. He saw it, he rode that wave, got a nest egg together. The second generation, that would be Donald's father, Fred Trump, he, was in, he saw the next frontier, which was federal mortgage guarantees, government guarantees for housing, for building middle-class, modest housing. Thousands of units all over Brooklyn and Queens made a fortune. On the weekends, he had the kids going, this is Donald and his four siblings going around building sites, picking up unused nails, because why would you waste a nail? And that was Fred. And then Donald comes along in the 70s when those subsidies, those government subsidies aren't really available anymore. And Donald pivots to the other end of the real estate spectrum, to luxury housing, to the idea that there are a lot of people out there with money who don't really want to be rich in the old Edith Wharton way of restraint, limestone facades, dignity, a kind of patrician style. 
A lot of people want to be rich in a very in-your-face way. They didn't want the cheapest possible thing. That was not the issue. They wanted the shiniest possible thing, the showiest possible thing. And Dalla was right there, and he put his name on it. And what does the name Trump stand for besides in-your-face luxury? We asked biographer Gwenda Blair if, after studying the family and interviewing Donald, she could detect an underlying philosophy that drives him, a set of beliefs beneath all that bluster and boasting. I think Donald Trump's philosophy boils down to winning and losing. That's it. Those are the two possibilities. And he is a winner, and anybody who's in the way is a loser. That's pretty much it. So whether to call that unprincipled, lacking principles, what he believes in, he believes in winning. That's what he believes in very fervently. And he got a good head start on that because his father was, his parents were quite drawn to a man named Norman Vincent Peale, who in 1952 wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, which was a huge bestseller and sold five million copies, was translated into dozens of languages, enormously popular, and basically said, not only is it okay to be successful, it's pretty much God's plan. So, and he, uh, Norman Vincent Peale gave several, uh, 10 actually steps, good number, 10, to success. And one of them, number one, I believe, was staple an image of success to your brain and never let go of it and never let any negative thoughts in. And how has Trump gotten away with his kind of tough and often inaccurate talk, which might not wear so well on another candidate? Blair says it's partly that he's been so easy to make fun of, especially the comb over, that allows people to feel less threatened by him, even one up on him. By the way, today the White House press secretary mocked his hair and Hillary, who has laughed at him in the past, got more serious about Trump today on her website. But more important than all that, says Blair, his supporters don't expect a candidate who sticks to the facts in this era of TV programs like The Apprentice. The whole world of reality television is a world in which things are not really real. They're not really true. And everyone accepts that premise. So the truthiness, in Stephen Colbert's wonderful word, the truthiness factor, the fact that this stuff is, is accepted that it's not really true, I think that has had a very interesting impact now that during the campaign, Time after time after time, Trump says stuff that's either pants on fire or pants a bit on fire or there's a little tiny piece of truth and then it's all exaggerated. All kinds of stuff that's just patently not true and doesn't seem to make a dent in his poll numbers. I think that's because he has established himself as not just the alpha male, but he's the alpha male of the universe in which truth doesn't matter anymore. And Reality TV really cemented that. It absolutely cemented him as being in charge of that domain that we all live in and we all accept where things aren't really true, but that's okay. Now via Skype, let's bring in New York Magazine political columnist Ed Kilgore. He's author of Election 2014, Why the Republicans Swept the Midterms, and he's been writing about Trump lately. Welcome. Glad to be here. Um, Ed, I saw your article posted this morning, headlined, GOP leaders terrified Trump will stay, but more terrified he will leave and make an independent run. If he is leading in these polls, if he would wind up with a Republican primary electorate that's passionately behind him, if he actually wins the primaries, why are they terrified, whoever these GOP leaders are, that he will stay? Well, um, because he's widely perceived as unelectable, uh, at least by Republican elites. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of the problem. Uh, there actually was a poll today, by uh, an online poll by Bloomberg, uh, asking about Trump's um, no Muslim entry proposal. Um, and it showed that 65 percent of Republicans favored it, uh, yet um, half of all Americans, and a, and a sizable plurality of that, oppose it. It's sort of a classic base versus swing voter choice you have to make. 
And I think um, Republican elites believe <clears throat> that even though Donald Trump can win a loud uh, and active minority of Republican voters and could theoretically uh, catapult into, into the nomination, he's really, he's really toast when it comes to a general election. That's the almost universal belief. Isn't there another line of thinking that would say we're in a turn out the base era in presidential elections and have been for some time, not a not a woo and insignificant swing voter block. And if that number you just gave, which I hadn't heard before, and that's pretty shocking that such a large majority of Republicans actually agree with this ban, the Muslims policy. Um, maybe he is. I hate to even suggest it, but maybe he is the path to victory rather than somebody like Mitt Romney, who really didn't have any passion behind him. Well, I mean, you know, the reality is you have to win swing voters as well as energizing the base uh, in most elections. And if you're a guy like Donald Trump, you probably have the capacity to create a lot of swing voters uh, who were base voters before. Um, now, it is possible that he can attract some marginal voters, people that don't usually participate. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm mainly talking about uh, the perceptions of Republican elites. And mm -hmm. I don't know any of them that really believe he could win a general election against Hillary Clinton. So I they keep might hearing, change their minds. And I keep hearing things like the party will never let Trump get the nomination. They will change the rules. They'll kick him out of the party. I heard somebody say, how much power does anyone have to stop the nominating process that they put in place with primaries and caucuses? Well, not a whole lot. I mean, they could, you know, unite behind a single candidate and thus improve the odds uh, of beating Trump, who, you know, after all, is polling in the 20s and at the very most in the 30s, which is well short of a majority. Uh, but no, they can't really take a nomination he has uh, earned away from him. And then, then there's the bigger problem, which you alluded to earlier, that um, if they play too uh, loose with the rules, they are inviting him to run uh, as a third party or independent candidate in November. And just about, uh, I mean, every test we've found of that proposition indicates he would kill the Republican nominee and almost guarantee a Democratic victory. So they really don't want that. But that's why they're in this sort of terrified if he stays, terrified if he leaves posture. Um, is the base, I should say, is the elite in the Republican Party actually as freaked out about Ted Cruz, who might be the most likely alternative to Trump, he's now leading in at least one poll in Iowa, as you know, as they are about Trump. I mean, until Trump unexpectedly burst on the scene as a factor, uh, Cruz was the fire-breathing leader of the Tea Party, who I think everybody thought was too radical to win a general election. Right. And, I, and, and this is an example of how someone as galvanizing as Donald Trump can kind of change the equation and make someone like Ted Cruz, uh, you know, seem a lot less radical. I have to be pedantic here. The poll that you and so many other people have been quoting, uh, the Monmouth poll of Iowa, which a lot of people are saying shows that Ted Cruz has now moved ahead of Donald Trump and, and that first uh, caucus state is kind of a a funky poll. It's got a, a, a likely caucus goer screen that puts an emphasis on prior participation in Republican primaries. If you'd had that sort of poll in 2008, it probably would not have predicted a Barack Obama victory in Iowa. He, like Trump, was trying to attract people from outside the normal universe <laughs> of, of uh, party primaries. So I'm, not, I'm a little skeptical. I'd like to see another poll or two showing Cruz ahead uh, before I, I'm, I'm willing to agree with this Cruz surge idea, but he is clearly doing better. Has probably moved into second place in many states, uh, including a lot of states in the South that aren't being polled very regularly. And and no, you're absolutely right. Uh, a guy that um, pretty much united Republican senators and their disdain for him now could be sort of the establishment savior against Donald Trump. That's how strange politics can become. How likely do you think? it is that Donald Trump would actually run as an independent if he feels that the party is un, 
fair to him, which is the criteria that he has laid out in the past, if all these leaders, Paul Ryan and everybody else, are now uniting against him? I think it's entirely, I mean, everything we know about Donald Trump is that he is an insatiable machine for attention. Uh, so why would he want to get out? Uh, he, he gave an interview to the Washington Post that was <laughs> published this morning and where, where he said very emphatically, I will never leave this race. Now, he may have been talking about the nomination race, but who knows? I, so I think that's a realistic fear on behalf of Republicans. And Trump's made it pretty clear that, you know, his pledge to support the Republican nominee is only as good as his perception of how he's being treated by right. Republicans. Right. Now that they're practically calling him a fascist beast, uh, or at least some of them are, I, I think yeah. the door is pretty open to a third party run whenever he chooses to say. exercise that option. So, Ed, stay there. We're going to lay out another scenario with another guest, and I want to get your reaction to it. Stay there. Okay. Time for evidence-based politics, where we meet a scholar who can pour cold, hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Many of us are asking, could Donald Trump really win the presidency? How would that be possible without the support of moderate Republicans and when registered Democrats far outnumber those in the GOP? Well, a research paper published in the Syracuse Journal of Law and Civic Engagement concludes that if all else fails, Trump could wage an independent candidacy, setting up a highly unusual electoral college scenario and potentially win. Sound impossible? Let's ask the paper's author, Victor Williams, professor of law at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He joins us via Skype. Welcome, Professor. Uh, greetings. Thank you for having me. So I'm looking at your paper. You're exploring a scenario with three candidates on the ballot. You're assuming Trump as the third party independent and where the electoral votes in some states actually do not go to the candidates with the most votes as we assume always that electoral votes win. First, can you explain the law that would allow those electors not to be committed? Well, if I could uh, back up just, uh, just a bit um, uh, to say uh, that my analysis is an analysis that's a two-track analysis. Uh, one analysis would have uh, Mr. Trump taking the Republican nomination uh, with a, a head-on um, contest with the, uh, the Democrat nominee. Um, and uh, I, I believe um, uh, Donald Trump would win that election. As a matter of fact, uh, as, as I was listening to the program, I, I was trying to do a little research uh, to find a look, uh, a London uh, bookie, uh, to take those five to one odds. Because even on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, contest with uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, I believe that Donald Trump uh, has a pathway. Why? If he's so toxic with swing voters, as Ed Kilgore was saying, what's that pathway? I, I believe Mr. Kilgore, uh, I, I enjoyed Mr. Kilgore's uh, analysis, um, but, but I believe Mr. Kilgore is wrong when he gets to the point of swing voters. I, be, I believe he underestimates uh, the, um, he underestimates uh, the significant, no, I won't say significant, the substantial number of Americans who are disaffected um, uh, uh, by their economic condition, who are uh, dissatisfied with uh, the level of leadership out of Washington, uh, who are uh, uh, angry. Uh-huh. At the at the at the uh, at the, at the na na right. lack of a so all right so maybe those swing voters are there. You disagree on your estimation of the potential for swing voters to go for Trump, and then this other scenario involving three candidates and legislators uh, in state legislatures unleashing the electoral college voters. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, this is, this gets a, 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 a somewhat complicated. Um, it, we, we have to speak to not the presidential election. We have to speak to the presidential selection processes, plural, 
of uh, the United States Constitution, our great Constitution. Um, and we, we first have to, uh, to remember um, that uh, the presidential election isn't a national election. It, it is indeed a, a, a state by state election. Uh, and we have to remember that uh, 48 of the states and the District of Columbia has a, uh, have a, uh, have a winner take all system. That is to say, the plurality winner um, takes all the electors uh, for a given. Right. Case. So with three candidates on the ballot, you could get as few as 34 percent of the electoral vote. Votes, uh, of the actual votes, and you win all of that state's electors because you have more than the other two candidates. Exactly. So uh, to to uh, to put it uh, di differently, 66 percent of any given state uh, could vote against Mr. Trump. 66 percent of any given state could vote against Mr. Trump in a tight uh, three-person uh, contest, um, not even right. counting the, the Green Party, the Independent Party, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Constitution Party that might shave off sure, some. Sure, just like in 1992, neither Clinton nor Bush got 50 percent of the vote uh, because of Ross Perot's popular vote. But the electors from the Electoral College would be those who are pre-committed um, to their candidate, right? So wouldn't all those electors in your scenario be Trump electors? And then how would you get the state legislatures to get them to vote for someone else? Oh, that's it's 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 such an interesting uh, process that our that our uh, that our framers established. Uh, first of all, we have to accept, we have to understand, um, and and I have to say this uh, as strongly as I possibly can. I believe the media, I believe the political elites have uh, failed to understand. They have failed to appreciate. They they failed to, uh, and they totally underestimated um, uh, the uh, political dissatisfaction in our country. They totally underestimated. Right. Um, I see. So some of those electors who are actually for the Democrat and the Republican might then flip to Trump. I want to get a reaction to this scenario. I realize we're way out on planet speculation, Ed. Uh, but what do you think about this? Because we are getting into wacky territory in real life. And you can react to his disagreement with you on swing voters, too. Well, you know, anything's possible. But I think a lot of the speculation falls into the... Uh, what I'd call the category of I could make a ham sandwich if I had some ham, if I had some bread. Um, the, empirically, the percentage of the electorate that's been swing vote has been declining pretty steadily now for a couple of decades, certainly since the early 90s. Uh, there was an extraordinary amount of disillusionment and anger in the electorate in 2008, also in 2012. I, I don't really see anything especially unique about 2016, except that a subset of Republicans is very dissatisfied with their own party's leadership and furious at the leadership of the country under Barack Obama. To suggest that that's a third or half of the population just because wrong track numbers are high, which they frequently mm -hmm. are, to me just doesn't make a great deal of sense. As for the idea that... Uh, Somehow or other, running as a third-party candidate, Donald Trump could win. Again, anything's possible, but, you know, uh, the two polls I've seen of a three-way race uh, both showed Donald Trump. Uh, actually, the hypothetical was running against Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush back in the summer. Put him at 19 and 20 yeah. percent. That's so, a long just give me way a, for 33 percent. Just, just give me a 10-second prediction on whether you think this ban Muslims policy will be a deal breaker with enough people to lose him the nomination. I think he's going to lose the, lose the nomination anyway. I don't know that this is a deal breaker. It may just solidify the support he's got. Thank you very much. And Professor, thank you also for joining thank us. You. Thank and you so much. And that's it for this week's edition of POTUS 2016. We're here each week at this hour calling the presidential horse race and with scholars who pour cold, hard facts through their research on the overheated campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.